I'm starting this video outside here on the 77 steps of the college to help us think about atomic structure. As you may recall in chapter 7, we talked about electrons jumping around inside atoms and changing energy levels. You can think of these steps as energy levels. In chapter 7, we saw that if you put some energy inside an atom, an electron may jump up to a higher level. When that electron falls back down, a photon may be emitted as energy. Chapter 19 will focus on the nucleus. And we've all seen images of atoms in textbooks or on the internet, but the size difference between the nucleus and the rest of the atom is hard to imagine. It's certainly not to scale in any book. That's the other reason I'm outside. If we imagine this marble as the nucleus of a simple atom, even hydrogen, then the electron cloud that surrounds that marble will be approximately the size of the campus. So imagine this. The campus is a sphere, and this marble is hanging in the center of that sphere. This is the nucleus of this atom. And the electron, which has a mass 2,000 times smaller than a proton, is circulating in that cloud somewhere. That's the 1s orbit. And that, when you think about the size difference in that, the nucleus represents 99.95% of the mass, but it's less than a trillionth of the volume of an atom. Try to wrap your head around that. I think that number is truly staggering, and I hope you do too. Well, let's head inside and continue our journey on Chapter 19 on Radioactivity and Nuclear Chemistry. This chapter deals with the nucleus, specifically radioactivity and nuclear chemistry. And here's the layout of where we're headed the next week. Here's our schedule. The final Blackboard quiz slash exam will be next Wednesday until Friday at midnight. That takes us through the, the end of the regular portion of the semester. In terms of a final exam in this class, there won't be an official final exam, but on Wednesday, May 6th, there's an optional Blackboard quiz exam which covers the five portions of the course that we cover after spring break via remote learning. This is completely optional. It can replace your lowest quiz score from the previous five. Like I said, it's optional. It can't hurt you. If you end up doing worse on it, I won't count it. If you decide to take it and it doesn't feel like it's going very well, you can just quit. It cannot hurt you. This is a free chance to improve. There is no penalty for not taking it or doing poorly. After that, we'll be done with the course. And there are some people cheering, and this is the kind of year where it feels like cheering. Here's a review problem from the end of chapter seven. This is at the beginning of the notebook for chapter 19. Which statement below, or statements, on the Bohr model is or are correct? So look through those statements, pause the video, and then I'll give you the answer. question that you have to have read very carefully because I think it's easy to choose choice E on here but the answer to this is only choice B. Choice C is incorrect because it says protons not electrons and so if that had said electrons it would be a true statement but protons don't jump around atoms they stay in the nucleus so it's just choice B is correct. So as I mentioned in my intro outside. We're doing the tour of the atom. We've got chapter 7 on quantum theory, which deals with electrons out here that can jump between levels. Chapter 19 on the nucleus deals with radioactivity. Just to think about big picture in atoms. If you just count the number of electrons in there, 
what nootrope element is that? If you don't have a periodic table with you, here's a snippet of one. So if we count those electrons, the blue, little blue circles on the screen, uh, there are four of them. So that's a neutral atom of beryllium, element four. And of course, since that's a neutral atom, it would also have four protons in the nucleus. And then the number of neutrons can vary depending on the isotope. And so inside that nucleus there, there would be four protons. And as I mentioned outside in the introductory portion of the video, this thing is not to scale by any measure. If you look at that nucleus there, it's probably four inches across. That would put the size of the overall atom at a couple of miles. And so the scale is completely out of whack. Here's what the chapter is about. We'll review some atomic structure. Some of the extra credit for the previous chapter also reviewed that. We'll look at types of natural radioactivity. I mean, alpha, beta, gamma. That'll be the end of part one then. Part two for this chapter looks at energy and radioactivity. We'll look at the equation E equals mc squared. And then we'll talk a little bit about bombs and nuclear power and half-life. And that'll be this, that's the part two of the video. And so thinking ahead, this maybe is checking something about your background. I would have asked you in a real class to have looked at this in advance, but which particle below is the most massive? And don't worry if you don't know this now, if you don't know this by the end of part one, then there'd be a little bit of uh, worry. But in this case, the largest particle of those up there will be the alpha particle, will be the most massive. Delta isn't a real particle in radiochemistry, so we're just going to focus on alpha, beta, gamma. The book talks about positrons, but we're just going to focus on these three, alpha, beta, gamma. So here's some atomic structure review. If you had done the chapter seven extra credit, you would have seen a similar problem like this. In fact, the uranium was one of the questions. And so, when we look at these symbols that are called nuclide symbols, that's, this, that's what this means right here, be a nuclide symbol. What two words go in those spots? What's the name of that number up here that represents the total number of protons and neutrons? And then think about what number goes down here in the second spot. So think about that for a moment. As often in these videos, pause for a moment, try that yourself, and we'll return shortly with the answer. The two missing blanks on here are mass number and atomic number. The mass number, of course, is the number of protons plus neutrons, since they combined make up most of the mass. The number of Electrons, in a sense, count, but they're so small, we just kind of ignore them. They do have mass, but it's very small. The atomic number is the lower number, and many times in the problems, this is not even written, because once you know it's uranium, it has to be 92 there. So this is not often written, but in this chapter, we will always be writing this, because that would be important in nuclear chemistry. It doesn't matter in chemical reactions, but in nuclear processes, that isotope will matter. Thinking back to some of our older material, the word isotope means two atoms that represent the same element, but they have different numbers of neutrons. So up on the board here, these are two isotopes of uranium, since they both have 92 protons, but the number of neutrons differs. And the one on the right up there, that was one of those extra credit questions. So the number of neutrons in there is ultimately going to be the mass number minus the atomic number. So for this isotope on the right, the number of neutrons will be 238 minus 92. Isotope has 146 neutrons. If you look at uranium 235, 
You see its mass is three lower, so if we check the math on that, we would say that one has, we would see that that one has 143 neutrons. So that's the number of neutrons. Of course, it has 92 protons because it's uranium. And when we look at the second part, when we talk about nuclear power and bombs, we, what we'll ultimately see is that in terms of power, the U-235 is the one that's sort of useful. The U-238 is actually the reason they have a lot of nuclear waste, but we'll get into that later. So here's a summary and some review of subatomic particles. Of course, the electron, as you should know by now, is negatively charged, very low mass, when we write it in our equations, this chapter, we will use this symbol. We will give it a mass number of zero. Even though it does have a very small mass, it's 2,000 times smaller than a proton or a neutron, so we're effectively calling it zero. So we write zero for the mass number. The atomic number is negative one because it has a negative charge. A proton, of course, is positively charged. It's in the nucleus. A neutron has no charge, and it is also located in the nucleus. So when we write these in our equations, P will be proton, N will be neutron. Pause the video and think about what numbers would you put in for a mass number for a proton and the atomic number for a proton. And then try to do the same thing for a neutron. And after you pause, I'll put the answers up. proton has a mass number of 1 and an atomic number of 1. And so when we put a proton in a balanced nuclear process, we'll put ones in a 1 and a 1 by that. Neutron has a mass equivalent of 1. It's just ever so slightly heavier than a proton. And then it has an atomic number of 0 since it isn't changing the identity of the element. So this one we'll see a lot. We actually won't write protons in many reactions. We're doing a lot of stuff with neutrons and electrons. So here's a group practice problem that compares two samples of water. Water has different isotopes. The water molecule up here on the right is the one that we would encounter most often because that contains the dominant isotope of hydrogen. And so that's why it has a one and a one. That isotope of hydrogen is actually only type of element known that doesn't have any neutrons in it. So since it contains hydrogen one, it has one proton, no neutrons. We can also make some water out of what we would call tritium. That's the hydrogen isotope that has two neutrons and one proton. We would call this tritiated water. That's the radioactive one. Would you expect these two samples to be chemically similar to each other if they contain two different isotopes of hydrogen. In terms of chemical reactions, you would expect them to be similar. Chemical reactions depend on the electron configuration. Both of the isotopes have one electron, so they behave the same chemically. In terms of physical properties, though, these will be different because they have different masses. So their densities will be different, for example, because their masses are different. That's how they're separated from each other. You separate isotopes many times in a centrifuge because their densities and masses differ. And so the physical properties are definitely different, but all the chemical reactions are the same. So here's kind of a summary slide comparing chemical and nuclear reactions. One way they're similar, just like before, the charge and the mass must balance on, as a whole. We'll see some minor different ways to think about that, but overall the charge and the mass must balance in both. Here's how they're different. In nuclear reactions, 
isotope you're using matters. So typically, we'll be adding the mass number to the items that are reacting and being produced. And so we're not used to doing that when we think about a balanced chemical equation, but this time we're putting the mass numbers in there. The second big difference, and I think this is the coolest part of nuclear chemistry and radioactivity, is that for the most part, we won't have the same elements on each side. And so we'll see later when we can start with carbon. And in a chemical reaction, we're used to having carbon on the right side. We can count our atoms. But this time, in this chapter, the elements will change identities. And so we're still going to make sure everything balances in terms of charge and mass. We're going to add up the isotopes and things like that. But, like I said, typically, for example, in this chapter, if we start with carbon, we're going to see later it's going to turn into nitrogen. And so I think that's the funnest part of chapter 19. So focusing here on radioactivity, or sometimes it's called natural radioactivity, and what this is, is you'll be taking a nucleus that is unstable, and then that nucleus will emit some energy or a particle. This is where this can be dangerous because the particles are carrying energy also, and so then it will go to a more stable place. It'll become a new element cases by the emission of this particle or energy getting to a more stable place. Just like in chemical reactions, it'll go to the little stable place, but this time it'll do it by changing identities. The three major types we'll look at are alpha, there's the Greek symbol, beta, there's the Greek symbol for B, and then gamma is the third type. And your, I want to turn down my audio for something here. Your book has this picture, your notes booklet has this picture from the textbook. And it actually shows some uranium metal coming out as a beam, and then that beam is split into multiple parts. And then there's the alpha on the bottom, the beta on the top, and the gamma. Uh, coming down the middle. I want to show you a short video clip which kind of shows this whole thing in motion and I think it will make a little more sense how the plates work and then we'll think about charges on these beams. So this is a short uh, video clip. That compares alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. There's the uranium source. This time it's in this blue box. And at this point, the beam is coming out straight, and it doesn't have the charge plates uh, between. And then you'll see in, the, in a moment in the video, the charge plates are introduced, positive on the top, negative on the bottom. And then the beam separates into three separate beams. And the charges on the plates are the same as in your book. This orientation is slightly different. The beta is bent upward. The alpha, we'll see, is bent downward. And you can see the alpha is bent less than the beta. And then the beam that doesn't go anywhere, I'll put the name up here in a second, that is the gamma. So those are the three types of radiation that can come out of a sample. And that matches the picture that's in your book. And so when you think about the way those are bent, say if you can assign charges to those three beams based on the plate, the orientation of the charges on the plates and the way they're bent. Since opposites attract, 
charge of the beta ray is negative. The gamma ray, of course, isn't dense, so it has no charge. It's neutral. And then the alpha ray has a positive charge. So we don't have much information about those gamma rays yet. Uh, but we do know the beta rays are negative and the alphas are positive. If you think about the way they're bent, the amount they're bent, you notice the beta ray gets bent a lot. And so it's carrying less momentum since it gets bent more. And so if you compare the masses of the two, the beta particle is much lighter. And so the alpha is more massive because it gets bent less. That will give us some clues to their, their identities. And so the beta is very lightweight and negative. The alpha particle is much more massive than an electron and it's positive. On first glance, it may sound like a proton, but it's even bigger than that, as we'll see in the next slide. And then the gamma ray doesn't bend at all, and it turns out to be massless as well. So we'll see in a moment, that's going to be a photon. And so it turns out the alpha particle is a helium nucleus. It has a plus two charge. It's just the nucleus of the helium atom being ejected from a larger element, when we use it in chemical rea or nuclear reactions, I'm sorry, we're going to write it with this symbol, a mass number of four, atomic number two, and we write HE for helium. And so we're going to use that in our balanced nuclear equations. The beta particles are negative. They turned out to be just electrons. They're named beta because they were the second kind of particle bond. And when we write them in our equations, we're going to write them like an electron. Mass number zero, atomic number negative one, put the E for electron. The gamma turned out to be a high energy photon. Photons have no mass, so the mass number will be zero. Obviously, they don't have protons, because they're photons. And so they'll also have an atomic number of zero, and then they get the symbol gamma. And so these are basically gamma rays from chapter 7. And so those are very high energy photons that are being emitted by nuclei to make them more stable. And so here are some examples of nuclear reactions. We'll do one of each kind. We'll just go in order. Alpha, beta, gamma. And so alpha decay is the loss of a helium nucleus. And try to complete the reaction here. If you take a uranium-238, you'll get what is called a daughter nuclei. That is the new element that forms. So that's the new element that you're going to make. And you get an alpha particle. So the daughter is always the new element. There's a picture from your text in your notebook with below it. And so try to finish that reaction. You're going to get an alpha particle and a new element. And so this is right there. This is the process when it's happening. That alpha particle is being ejected. Remember, we're just we're deep inside the nucleus now, so we're inside the center of the atom. We're not dealing with electrons. Then that, that alpha particle is ejected. So one of the products is going to be the alpha particle. After that, we just think about our numbers here. This has to balance. The mass has to balance. So the new daughter nuclei is going to have a mass of two. 34 because these two have to add up to 238. Two protons also left with it, so the atomic number drops by two, and so then this is going to have 90 protons. This is where you need a periodic table handy. 
look up element 90 on your periodic table, and you will see the symbol TH, that is thorium. And so everything balances, but you notice the uranium is gone, and now we get a new element, thorium. And so that right there is the nucleus of a thorium atom. We get a new atom produced. Example 19.1 and question one on page 802 are very similar examples. And one nice thing about dealing with the radiation types here is that there will be no exceptions in, in these examples. Every time you see alpha decay, the mass will go down by four, the element number on the periodic table will drop by two, no exceptions. Here's the beta decay. It's tossing out an electron. And we'll think about what happens to that atomic number. People are familiar with radiocarbon dating. They use carbon-14 to date objects that were once living because they absorb radioactive carbon dioxide in very small amounts or, or eaten plants that contain a little bit of that. And so we can determine how old something is. And so there's your carbon-14 nucleus. It's going to put out an electron. That'll be one of the products. And if you think about balancing all of this, think about what you have to get from this. Think of the mass here, atomic number, and then the element, and it won't be carbon. See if you can come up with that. Since the electron has a very small mass, the mass number will stay the same. It's still 14. So we're assuming it's almost the same as 14, just differs by a little bit. The, the atomic number has to balance. So we have six total on this side. Over here, we have a negative one. In order to get six total, now we have seven protons in this new element. If you check your periodic table, element seven is nitrogen. And so we have made a new element. Nitrogen 14 is the product of radioactive carbon decay. I think it's easy to think you get like carbon 12 or something, that's a stable nucleus, but in reality you produce a nitrogen. And so that's the product of that reaction. Every time you have beta decay, no exceptions, the element number will go up one and the mass will stay the same. No exceptions. And really what's happening in the process is a neutron is actually just being converted to a proton and then an electron is being ejected. That's effectively what's happening. We're just basically changing a neutron to a proton. Here's why radioactivity can be dangerous. Here's a picture from your textbook that is not in your notebook, but, but here is the carbon-14 decaying to become a nitrogen-14 nucleus, and then there's the electron being ejected. If you happen to be standing near this, depending on the quantity of material, and it depends on the exact type of nuclei around, but that will produce this high energy electron. This could theoretically hit somebody, go through their skin potentially, and then ultimately it could go down and damage their DNA. We would call this ionizing radiation. And so DNA damage could potentially cause cancer, and so that's why some radioactive materials can be dangerous, especially if they're ingested. The third type is gamma radiation. And remember the symbol for gamma was zero, zero for mass number, atomic number. And so in reality, if you think about that symbol, zero, zero, you can't get a new element. And so what happens with gamma emission, and I'm gonna write this in the notes slightly different than your textbook, is that in gamma emission, 
it's always coupled with another kind of radioactivity. It could be coupled with alpha or beta, but it always goes with another one. And what happens is, you're going to release this high energy photon to get you from an unstable, or we're going to call it a metastable state, down to a stable state after like the initial ejection of a particle. And so what we'll do is we'll look at this as a two-step process. And step one will be, in this case, a beta decay. And so use what you know from earlier, where you think about a product that goes in that spot when you have beta decay. And then step two of this is actually the alpha decay. In terms of atomic symbols, the same item will go in both spots there. But in this case, the product of step one will be what we call a metastable or unstable nucleus. And then it will go down to a lower energy by releasing a gamma ray or gamma photon, but it will be actually the same symbol in there. So grab a periodic table and see if you can figure out the identity of especially the first one, because like I said, simple ones are going to be the same. And so you get technetium element 43, because once again, everything adds up. 99 equals 99 plus 0. And then down here, 42 equals 43 minus 1. And so that's the beta decay. Element number goes up 1 new identity. The M on this stands for metastable. And it ultimately what it means is you have an unstable nucleus. I always imagine somebody hanging out on the edge of a diving board, just kind of teetering on that. And then when you fall, in this case, you release the gamma photon, but you still have technetium, but this time it's a stable technetium nuclei. And so this is used very commonly for medicinal purposes or medical purposes. From molybdenum, they make this unstable technetium. It has a very short half-life, several hours, and then it releases gamma radiation and then it goes to the stable place. And so, like I said, this is always a two-step process. If you think back to chapter seven, gamma rays were, in, were on that electromagnetic spectrum. And you can see them all the way over on the right on this. It's very high energy, high frequency photons, gamma radiation, there it is. It's the same gamma rays from chapter seven. And these are very painful. And so depending on the quantity involved, um, this can do serious damage to a person. Uh, blocking gamma rays takes approximately 24 inches of concrete to block a gamma ray. And so they're very difficult to deal with. Well, here's a good practice problem for you. Thinking about doing two decays in a row. We're going to do an alpha and then a beta. And so I gave you the starting product here. It's polonium. 218. I just wrote the nuclide symbol in a slightly different way. When you see it like that in the book or on a quiz, uh, the 218 is just the mass number. So there's nothing to be afraid of there. That's just another way of writing it. But you know polonium has 84 protons because that's where it is on the periodic table. So do an alpha decay first. And then the product you get from step one will be the nuclide that starts process two. Here's what you should get for the first process. It's alpha decay, so you gotta have a form of two there in the HE. The mass of the other product will be 214 because 218 is four plus 214. Element number drops by 2, you get 82. If you check your periodic table, that will be Pb lead. 
once again, these numbers add up to that. That material is the reactant, if you will, in process two. This time it's a beta decay. And so we'll write your electron. I would recommend writing the electron first and then dealing with the top line and the bottom line after that. So there's your electron. It's got a mass of zero, effectively, atomic number is minus one. So our final product will still have a mass of 214, but this time the element number will go up one, and so it's going to be element 83 in the periodic table. If you check that out, it's bismuth, Bi. It's a product if you've ever eaten or consumed Pepto Bismol. That's what the biz is in Pepto Bismol. It's the element bismuth. And so there it is. That's your final product. So alpha drops us two, and then the beta brings us back up one. Your book has a figure which shows an example of a decay series, they call it. And I have a snippet of that in your notebook, but this is the whole figure. And what it shows on this axis, on the y-axis, it shows the number of neutrons in something. And then the bottom here, the x-axis, is the atomic number, z. And so this identifies the element, this identifies the isotope. And so if you think about the problem we just did, see if you can find that in the snippet we looked at. And there's a little kind of key up here. It shows that in, in an alpha decay, the arrow always goes in the same direction because the atomic number drops. That's why it shows the arrow going backwards. And so the alpha decay we did in the previous problem, there is step one right there. We took that 218 polonium, we dropped it back down two spots to lead 214. The small blue arrow there, that's the beta decay. So that's process two we looked at. That's the beta, the first one was the alpha. And it's kind of interesting here, this goes back and forth between bismuth and lead. And so when you start at uranium 238, it has a very long half-life. Billions of years, I believe, and then it goes down and finally ends at lead 206 after a long series. Well, that ends part one. Here is some practice for part one. Q1 and Q2 on page 802 deal with radioactive decay and the multiple choice questions. These are some excellent book questions. Be cautious if you do part if you do problem one on 804, only do parts A through C. The other part, or two, I can't remember if it goes up to D or E, but they don't deal with things we dealt with, or they deal with things we can deal with. Three and five, do A and B only on five, and then here are some later ones, 66 and 73. And so you can drop in on Zoom, of course, or uh, email me, I'll set up a one-on-one -on -one time. I'll work with you pretty much any time of the day, if you want to, just drop me a line.